So um, I just wanted to welcome everybody to this uh, chance to have a bunch of Upland folks in Utah uh, get together. It's great to have all your uh, interest and um, that kind of thing. I, I think sometimes we we think Utah is just a bunch of big game folks, hooves and horns kind of thing. And and while I think we all like that, I, uh, there's definitely some of us who are uh, fairly uh, dedicated. I, does anybody? I've had this feeling before, but does anybody like feel guilty when you're big game hunting because you left your dogs at home and like they have to be at home while you're out? Like I, yeah, I do that. Um, hit me pretty hard especially when the deer there's no deer <laughs> then it really hits hard but uh anyways. i take i take my dog gotcha i mean that you can only take them so far though right mm, not really <laughs> well. leave them in the can and leave them in the kennel and when you go walking and then yeah. sometimes you uh middle of the day you take the dog and look for birds yeah I just meant, you, you know, it's illegal to hunt with the dog, but, um, so, so yeah, welcome everybody. Glad you're here. This is, this is the inaugural event. Uh, we haven't done this before. And so I'm, I'm kind of excited. I'm hoping that we can, uh, turn this into something that happens every year. Um, and, and we can get together and, and, and talk. Um, so, and remind everybody to, to mute uh, if you haven't already um, un until there's discussion to be had. Um, so a couple of things to, to go over. Um, oh, I did wanna ask, so we're doing this a little bit later this year, partly because it's the first time we're trying it. And there's kind of this, I've had this debate in my head, you know, it, it seems natural to do a forecast before the season starts, right? That, that would be, seem a little more logical. On the other hand, having the season start gives us something to actually talk about because <laughs> most of us haven't spent a whole bunch of time in the field per se prior to that, um, that start date. So I actually did a poll. Uh, let's see if I can do this. So if, if you um, see that and have a chance, go ahead and, and let me know your opinion and that'll help us for, uh, for next year. so like three quarters of you have answered we'll we'll give that a little bit more time and i can kind of put that off to the side um so it looks like we're fairly in favor before the season which is understandable so um, we'll, we'll shoot for that, uh, next year, um, uh, when we get going and I've, I've talked to the Upland game program at DWR and our other partners. So, um, I did want to mention, Comment. we have, uh, uh, co-sponsors, I guess on this. Um, so I'm with Utah state university, uh, extent extension and, uh, the DWR, especially the Upland game program um is co-sponsoring along with uh utah's chapter the backcountry hunters and anglers and then um the pheasants forever and the utah uh chucker foundation did i i don't think i missed anybody there but i wanted to mention them um we we kind of have a, a panel of sorts uh so that includes uh myself uh brett wanacott and Blair Stringham, who Blair's with the uh, um, uh, UDWR. So I was going to, Brett, do you just want to introduce yourself quick? And then uh, Blair, if you would. I thought you just introduced me. I'm, I'm Brett I didn't Wanaka. say anything about you. <laughs> well, I don't know. There's much to tell, but uh, I'm mean, just a guy that likes to spend a lot of time over bird dogs, chasing birds. Um, done a few KSL shows. Anyway. It's, uh, it's good to be here. I'm honored to be on the panel, so thank you. Thanks, Brett. And Blair? Yep, I'm Blair Stringham with Utah Division of Wildlife Resources. So my day job, I do primarily the waterfowl stuff for the state, but I've also had my hand in Upland as well and 
on Upland quite a bit too. So happy to be here. Thanks, Blair. Um, so a couple of things uh, as far as like guidelines for this discussion, I just wanted to uh, mention a few things. If, if you didn't hear before, we are recording this um, for other folks. Uh, remind people to mute if you're not uh, talking. Uh, we're gonna, so we're gonna try to avoid hot spotting in uh, both questions and answers. And, and by hot spotting, I mean like specific areas. I, we can talk regions, uh, parts of the state, that kind of thing I think is appropriate. But we, you know, we don't want to, uh, we're all fairly sensitive, I think, to specific areas. And that's kind of our own little upland culture or maybe just hunter culture. So uh, let's, let's watch that. Obviously, we're going to ask for courtesy all around, uh, even, even if we have disagreements. Differences of opinion are fine. There's no problem with that um, if we just do it courteously. And then um, I think what we're going to do is do, if you have questions, let's do it through chat. Uh, and I'll try to um, keep my eye on it. And if the, if the panel members and, and Al, if you'll um, help me kind of monitor that if I'm missing something, um, I'm, I'm trying to do a lot of things at once here. So um, that'll be good. And, and we can, we can kind of go through uh, different questions that you have uh, that way. And I, that doesn't preclude discussion though, an open discussion. I like that, uh, and as long as it's pertaining to that uh, question that's that's being asked, um, and to do that, I think uh, if we have something going on, just hit the raise your hand button, which is under the reactions button at the bottom of your Zoom, and we'll watch for the raised hands in the participant list, and we can go from there. If we miss you, apologize. We'll try to get to you and, and try to manage this uh, as best we can. Um, I think that's about it. Uh, I thought we could um, start like uh, just kind of going species by species, really, uh, just generally on, on what what we think is going on out there um, with that process. And so uh, maybe uh, Blair, would you want to you want to start us off with um, some information from the DWR on on uh, what you guys have done. Like, I know you have some chucker uh, camera work that Avery did and uh, uh, there was some other information. Okay, yeah, I'll kind of hit on the stuff I'm most familiar with. Um, a lot of our upland game species, we don't do any formal surveys for. Um, what we do do is collect a lot of harvest data. And so on our webpage, you can look at the harvest data each year. Um, it's underneath the upland section of our water or of our upland game page. And within there, there's an annual report each year that'll show harvest for each species. And so we track a lot of species that way. Um, we do have some species that we do uh, formal surveys for. As Dave mentioned, we have chucker cameras where we use those to track our, our chucker populations. For the grouse species, we do some let counts. Um, and for a few other species, um, we do some surveys as well. But for the most part, it's mostly tracked through harvest. Um, as Dave alluded to, um, some of our data, I guess I'm not, I'm not, I don't know if Avery summarized all of our camera data yet. Maybe Dave, you may have heard more than I had, but I do know our, our grouse counts were down for sage grouse this year. Um, they've been trending down for, for some time now. And um, so they have been lower and you've probably seen that in the number of permits that we've been offering. Um, sharp kills have been kind of holding their own the last year or two. So their sharp tail numbers have been pretty decent, um, but both those species you have to have a permit for it to harvest. So, um, other Dave, are you are you familiar with the chucker data yet? Have you seen any results from that? Yeah, I'm I'm looking for the email I got from from Avery. So okay. if I can if I can find that, I'll pull it up. But I'm okay. not seeing it quite yet. I know just, I guess, anecdotal and information from our biologists. It sounds like chuckers, for the most part, have been down this year from where they were last year. A lot of that's just because of the drought. Um, it's, it's probably impacted quite a few upland species, but particularly chuckers, they've been trending down from where they were a year ago, and we had some pretty good things out there. Okay, any, anything else, Blair? Uh, that's all. 
I can think of at the moment. If something else comes up, I'll pipe up. Okay. Uh, Brett, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, I haven't had dogs on the ground for chuckers just yet. Um, I'm one of these guys that's a little bit of a rattlesnake sissy, mostly <laughs> when, they, when they're in combination with my dogs. Um, maybe I'm a little bit uh, <laughs> maybe I'm a little bit overly uh, protective of my dogs, but I don't like to put them on the ground. But I've had them on the on the ground for grouse quite a bit, and for pheasants a little bit, and Hungarian partridge a little bit, and sharp tails a little bit. Um, I think sharp tails are probably about where they've been, at least in the in the places that I've ran dogs. Um, of course, realizing that upland game populations are very localized or can be. Um, you know, you might be seeing something different where you're running. Um, Hans, I've been seeing some Hans, but the cubbies were smaller than, than what they were last year in the places that I'm seeing them. Um, uh, forest grouse, I've seen some really good numbers of forest grouse in some places. In other places, I'm seeing numbers dramatically down. Um, and I don't know if it's if there was some magical precipitation or something, and Dave might have a little bit more of a... Uh, why that could be. But, um, anyway, um, at my suggestion, if you're looking for forest grouse and you're not finding them, uh, change mountain ranges, tra change drainages, change something. Um, Do you see any trend to that, uh, like spatially? Is, is um, like north to south, east to west, anything like that? So most, to be fair, most of my, most of my, uh, I'm running dogs mostly in the northern part of the state um from salt lake north so i haven't been able to really put my finger on it to me the habitat looks pretty good where the populations are down and it looks pretty good where the populations are up at first i thought i was seeing no insects in the places where populations are down but now after you know being about a month in um i'm seeing insects in some of those places that you know grasshoppers and things that, so i can't really put my finger on it Gotcha. Um, so I can I can talk a little bit to forest grouse. Um, that's what I spent most of my time with too. And again, mo almost mostly northern Utah. Um, but I, I think um, I do think I'm I'm seeing certain areas that seem like they pulled off some dusky production, and then other areas where it's I'm mostly running into adults. Um, uh, in in twos and threes i haven't seen the big groups come together yet um so we're still at least where i'm hunting we're still a little bit early for that um but it's uh yeah d dusky production seemed a little spotty uh based on my experience rough grouse are like if you're in that brooding habitat the broods are there and and uh they have i don't know i'm I'm seeing anywhere from six to eight chicks in the broods, which is pretty good. You know, it's 50% or higher. I uh, agree with that. I have seen some bigger broods with duskies also, but again, yeah. I'm either seeing one dusky grouse or I'm seeing, you know, 10. Yeah. And I, so, so when I say big groups, I mean bigger adult groups are combined. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah when I, good. yes. Brood groups are, are generally fairly good sized, like, six to six to eight birds is probably what I'm seeing when I get into a brew group. Um, the brew groups just seem a little spottier. But. I apologize for losing video. I don't know what's going on. Maybe my internet's not strong enough right now, but I can't seem to get my video to pull back up. So, <clears throat> so does anybody else want to uh, comment about their experiences with forest grouse or um again remember we're, we're trying not to hot spot anything so but if you do i'm going to leave it open and you can you can jump in and are you seeing what me and and brett are seeing are you are you seeing something different dave this is randy i've been out a number of times and i'm finding this year a lot like last year it's a boomer bust for me in the areas that i'm hitting areas that i'm hitting have really good mostly duskies are what i'm getting into um areas will have really good numbers and then i'll swing off to a different range or something where i traditionally see birds and not seeing anything so it's boomer bust for me uh right now 
and I, I feel the same way with duskies. I, I feel like if I target roughies, if I'm in that, if it just, ha I don't know, it has a feeling to me when I'm in that kind of habitat, then, then there's a brood, there's usually a brood or two there. Uh, if I'm in the right stuff for, for, for roughs. Um, is there, uh, what about elevationally? Are we, are you seeing duskies up high on the ridges? Are you seeing them still in the brooding areas? Um, any, any comments about that? They've been all over the mountain for me. I've seen them down in the brooding areas and I've seen them up on ridges. Um, they've just kind of been all over still. I, I think there's a fair amount of them down low still, but you know, all over the mountain, I don't know what your experience has been. I'm seeing adults up on up high, but the broods aren't up high yet. They're they're still kind of yeah, it, it's dusky, so it's where you find them. But um, and we can we can talk if you want to talk habitat a little bit. There you go. Uh, so Caitlin says, do you mind explaining? Uh, Brooding areas uh, for the beginners on the call. Um, so for me, uh, like dusky brooding is, it's usually associated with an aspen and some sort of mountain shrub edge. And, and it's generally, you know, if you're up in the mountains, it's, it's generally not up on the ridges. It's, it's kind of, it's either in the mid slope or down, uh, you know, where the, where the valley um, bottoms out a little bit. And, um, when I, when I say mountain shrubs, I'm talking, um, like, like a, one of my favorite places to look for is service berry in sagebrush next to Aspen. Um, that's a, that's a real nice for me habitat to target for duskies, um, uh, to get into some broods and, so we did, of those of you not aware, we did a dusky grass study from 2015 to 2017 up here in Logan. And what one of the most surprising things we found was that, that the dusky grass broods spent uh, 60 plus percent of their locations were out of the forest in the sagebrush and often in that sagebrush service berry mix um, during, during the brooding period. As so basically late June to into September and uh, going into October with when the brood breakup starts to happen. And it's changed, it's that research changes has changed the way I hunt duskies because I used to just always look for aspen and now I look for that it's edge and then the mountain shrubs out there. So, and then you know, choke cherry. Um, What's a, some other mountain shrub? Elderberry. Uh, one of my favorites is if you can find mountain ash. Um, so mountain ash is that uh, little orange berry, like it's a cluster of berries, and it it's usually growing in really steep stuff. Um, and and I I just if I can find that in a and it's usually in an understory like under aspen or under conifer. Um, Man, the duskies just love that when the, when the berries start coming. So I, I, that probably helps with dusky broods. Is there any questions about dusky brooding habitat? Um, as as far as roughies go, uh, roughy brooding habitat is pretty much roughy habitat, which is. What I found for myself is having a tree overstory, uh, aspen usually, sometimes conifer, um, and then and then a nice like mid story. So um, like something over my head, mid story of like choke cherry or uh, some other mountain shrub, or even like multiple age aspen that are together. And, and basically it's, it's the density of the habitat, right? So if, if you're not crawling through and, and you, you look at it and you're like, if you're not looking at it and saying, I don't know how I'm going to get a shot off in here, uh, 
then you're not in roughy ground. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's just what roughies love. And I've caught them in between sometimes, but most of the time, uh, that's that's where I'm finding them. And so what I what I tend to look for with roughies is if I'm looking at a mountain slope, I'm looking for that bench. I'm looking for that place that flattens out just a little bit, collects water, and uh, and gets that's where you start to get those mountain shrubs in the understory of the aspen. Uh, we've got Matt, uh, Matt Crandall. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I'm new to upland hunting as an adult, and I've been at it for a couple of years now, and I'm still having a difficult time locating spots to hunt. Um, obviously, we don't want to get into specifics, but when you're trying to find somewhere to hunt, what what would be some tips that you would give uh, someone who's trying to trying to find their own hunting holes? Yeah, I th I think it's a great question. Some of that goes back to the information I just shared about brooding habitat, and I'll let I'll let Brett and Blair or anybody else who wants to say, but I'll start off with this. Um, it just so if I'm targeting duskies, I'm thinking one thing, and if I'm targeting roughies, I'm thinking another. So for most of Utah with, with rough grouse habitat, you, it, it's very spotty. And, and there's these little, these little areas that have the right stem densities, uh, mid-story and overstory, and whether that's mountain shrubs or just young regenerating aspen or whatever it is. Um, and then you, you have to have that habitat in a, I don't know, just a, like a quarter, a square quarter mile or less, even a little bit, but not, it can't be just one little patch, right? It has to be in this little chunk of, of uh, space that, that the roughies can use as their home range. And that's, when I find that, I'm almost like, it's, it's I'm surprised when I don't find a roughie in that, in Utah. Um, Sometimes the population's down, and so you get a little more sporadic. But in a year like this, especially when there's the broods are still together, you should be finding roughies if if you're looking for that. And so for me, the way to start with roughies is um, aspen. Look look for young aspen, or if it's older aspen and there's no mid story, if there's no, nothing in there that's over your head, ignore it. That's that's a lot of Utah's aspen habitat. We have a lot of 80 to 100 year old aspen <clears throat> that's like 60 to 80 feet high. And it has like an understory of like snowberry that comes up to your waist. For the most part, that's not gonna hold a lot of rough grass. <coughs> Excuse me, that until, until that mid story goes up over your head and really blocks your view, a roughie's just not comfortable. They can't get away from a goshawk in an old aspen stand with with uh, snowberry and that's it yeah yeah i've noticed that <laughs> i'll um you know e scout and look for aspens and then go and try and find uh some grouse and then i'll get to that location and like you say they're 80 to 100 year old aspens and i'm walking through there just knowing i'm not going to find a bird Yep. So is, is it just, I need to keep on walking or? No, you need to go, you need to go to a different spot. Yeah. And, and so when I e-scout for rough grouse, this is what I do. I, I get the topography uh, lines up there or Google Earth, you know, will do the 3D thing. I guess Onyx does 3D now. Um, and I look for that in the Aspen on a slope. I look for the bench. I look for where it, where the water has to settle a little bit, that's where you're going to get that mid story and those those mountain shrubs coming up inside the aspen. That's that's been my number one way of finding rough grouse. That's that's a great tip because I haven't noticed that before. But now that I'm thinking back on it, most of my grouse I've got have been on a bench. They they're on a bench or in the bottom. But yeah. It, the water has to collect so that those mountain shrubs can have enough moisture and enough soil depth to grow because if you're on a slope there's not enough soil built up for a mountain shrub to really 
take off and go. Uh, Rob, you've had your hand raised. Yeah, so um, I'll be new to Upland this year out here in Utah. I'm originally from Kansas, so I'm used to chasing quail and pheasant out here. So yeah, Kansas, wildcat or Jayhawk? Oh, Jayhawk. All right. I mean, there's only one correct answer to that. So I, I was I was the small game specialist for KDWP. Oh, there. were you? Yeah. Were Anyways, you? small connection. Um, well, uh, out, of, out of all the species to chase in Utah, you know, between partridge and grouse, is there one that you recommend that'd be good for um, someone who's just now chasing upland in Utah and to have good success? Um, I just, I for me, that's just seasonally. So early season is forest grouse are great. Um, they're, there's a lot of public land. There's a lot of access. Um, and if you know what to look for, um, there's, you can find birds in most years. And then as that season progresses, that's when I moved to, uh, Chucker mostly in Utah. And again, lots of access available and then just, you know, getting your legs in shape <laughs> and your dogs to, to run. But gotcha. Thanks. Does that help? Yeah. So Brett and, and, and Blair and anybody else is, is what I said about roughies is, is that matching or do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I typically think of rough grouse habitat being areas I don't even want to hunt. Like if you feel like you can't shoot more than like 20 feet, then you're probably in a pretty good rough grouse spot. Duskies tend to just have a lot more open um, canopy cover in trees, and especially as you start moving up in elevation, you'll get a lot of that understory area with you know a decent conifer mix especially dug fir you'll start seeing them in there hey brad yeah can you can you see emily's chat on a, a dog question yeah i was gonna i was gonna reply to that i'm struggling to find my video and i'm still i'm for whatever reason i'm worried about it so i've been hunting this video thing down but I, i'll answer a question emily um i don't really know why dogs have a hard time pinning grouse down sometimes some dogs really do um i think if you run on grouse more often i think your dogs will start to pin them uh, sometimes early season like this scent conditions are poor and the birds are in brood groups so if you can't see your dog they are um, sometimes those brood groups like the hand will stand up and start clucking or making noises to her chicks and I think a lot of dogs just can't handle that. And so they, they may, you know, maybe move in a little bit closer and bump them. I don't know if that's what you're experiencing or, or not. Does that sound, uh, you know, along the lines with what's going on? Uh, yeah, and Emily's my wife's name, by the way. I'm just on her computer. But um, yeah, I mean, sometimes they bump them and sometimes they just can't seem to locate them. Like they'll get really birdie and be all over the place, but just can't seem to actually pin down the bird. You know, that seems to be the problem that I've had anyway on grouse. And chucker, pheasant, no problem, but grouse for some reason have been a little harder. I've, I've got two comments there. One is um, most rough grouse and blue grouse are very, very willing, in my, in my experience, very willing to walk or when a dog's on point, like get up and start walking away or around. And um, it's pretty it takes a lot of training for a dog to see that and not <laughs> uh, bus point. Um, and, and so I found that with my own dogs. Um, it just takes, like Brett said, you have to run a lot on them before the dog's willing to be patient through that. The other thing is often birds jump in trees and I've, I've witnessed this both hunting and trapping both rough grouse and blue grouse where the dog still just working the scent and the bird goes up in the tree. And if you're not close enough to hear that, you don't know it's there. And the dog doesn't necessarily know it did that either, unless they're really experienced uh, forest grouse dogs understand that. And, you know, I, I've known some that sit and just look up at the bird for you. My old, I had an old short hair who would point them up. In, in fact, I, I, I figured out as he got older, I think he flushed them on purpose and then he would stand under, <laughs> under the tree and look at them. But uh, so there's a couple comments about why it's so hard. But I, I also agree with Brett. The sending conditions are awful usually. Um, right away in the morning is is when I have my best dog work, and then it, man, after that first hour, it drifts away and, until those temperatures get below 60, and really 50 is 
50 and below is better, but we're just barely starting to see that now. So, And if there's dew on the plants, that seems to make it significantly better. Yep. Um, also take into account, you know, the places you're finding rough grouse, oftentimes the wind might be swirling and turning. So you add that to the poor scent conditions and boy, it can really, really cause you some problems. That might be some of the, um, and that bird walking around thing, you, you know, that's something you can train for. Um, I, I certainly train for it. Um, but anyway, I hope that helps some. Thanks for adding that, bro. Yeah, thank you. It sounds like it's it's more of a me problem than most, but <laughs> I seem to notice it with my dog anyway. No, we, I, I've I've struggled with that too. Um, you know, by the time I'm chasing chuckers, it's it's cold out, and and chuckers are a lot more willing to. They're either going to flush, or uh, hold, or just book it uphill versus like. Um, sit there and walk it out in the open like like the forest grouse do at times. Um Alex, I'll 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 come to you in just a second. Um I did want to mention this and I've been trying to conceptualize this. And again, if if other people want to chime in, but so rough grouse have a certain spatial uh home range that that they live in and it's pretty small. Um, in fact, it's, uh, it's, it's about the size of what a hunter can really walk pretty thoroughly. And so the home range of a rough grouse and, and the, I'll call it the home range of a hunter or what a hunter can cover uh, match up pretty well. So if you find the right rough grouse habitat, the probability of getting into rough grouse is really high. But if you, if you look at other species like your prairie grouse, sage grouse, and I'll include blue grouse because blue Dusky grouse to me are just the prairie grouse that lives in the mountains, right? They're, they're way more related to a, a sage grouse and a sharp tail than they are a rough grouse. And what our research has shown is that they use the landscape more like a sage grouse does. And what that means is their home range sizes are on the magnitude of 10 times or more than a rough grouse. And so what that means is, is you're gonna have to walk through a lot of really good dusky grouse habitat before you find a dusky grouse just because their home range is so much bigger. And so it's just gonna, it's just like hunting sharp tail or sage grouse. You're gonna walk through a lot of good habitat before you get into sharp tails or before you get into sage grouse usually. And, and, and that's the same for duskies. And I, I think a lot of people get frustrated because you know they'll learn what good dusky grouse habitat is and they'll go to that dusky grouse habitat and they won't find birds. And it's like, well, it's just because their home range is so big that they might be there tomorrow, but they weren't there that day and, and they're moving around. And then they have this elevational change, which is another way to target dusky grouses. As the season progresses, they, they move up slope. Um, I'm not gonna say like a foot of elevation, it's just where those brooding areas are, then they're gonna move up from there. But I, wanted, I just wanted to put that spatial thing out there for folks because it's, it's really helped me understand why I'm getting into birds and sometimes why I'm not and what it's going to take to get into birds. Um, for duskies, you might have to hit a lot of the same really good habitat and then you'll get into them. But anybody else want to chime in on that? Have any comments about that? I was going to add some real quick and I think it ties to Lee's question in the chat about um, hunting mortality being additive or compensatory and then hurting a population by hunting the same place over and over and over. Um, for the most part, upland game is going to be compensatory. Um, just those boom and bust cycles. I mean, if you don't shoot a lot of birds this year, they're not going to carry over to the next year necessarily. You see them, you know, going up and down like this quite a bit. So it can be both, um, probably in the beginning compensatory, but that second part of your question, and as Dave just talked about, with those small home ranges for rough grouse, if you really get into rough grouse, and then you keep going back over and over and over, you're likely you could kill off that entire basically family of, of grouse right there. And it's less true with duskies, because as Dave mentioned, they have this large home range. And so you'll find them, you know, in that nice brood ring habitat you talked about earlier. But by November, they're going to be five, even 10 miles away up on top of a ridge eating pine needles instead of aspen leaves and berries and things. So a lot of that is just the scale and those species that stay in small areas. If you continually go back and hunt them a lot, you will definitely impact the population. 
<laughs> so Chuck, Chuck Carpenter just added, yeah, one hunt per covert per year. So as you build up the number of places you go, um, one, one ethic that I find common among a lot of more experienced upland hunters is they'll just hit it once a year and, uh, and then, and then move on. And, and for the most part for forest grouse, um, I follow that. I, there's just no need to go back to the same spot. There's so much other areas and there's so many new areas I'm always wanting to try. So the, the compensatory additive thing is really interesting. Um, as Blair mentioned, compensation is a very, um, so something that upland birds can do, especially the short lived high reproductive, like rough grouse are in that category. You know, they're putting out 12 to 15 eggs. Um, and so it, it's really hard to sh shoot out a population to where you're affecting the next year's population uh, versus, you know, sage grouse are long lived and, you know, low reproductive. And so they have a much higher potential of turning additive. And that's part of why the division uh, only does 10% of the let counts is to keep that uh, that number of birds being harvested below a threshold where it could even approach additivity uh, to the population. What's interesting about upland game research is when it first started in the 50s and 60s, and they were really looking at harvest. Most of the studies coming out were just compensatory, 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 but they weren't they weren't taking into account like um, immigration and emigration out of the population. Uh, they weren't taking into account refugia and, and those kinds of things. And so as that research has gone on and some of the more modern research, it basically says that it's kind of, it's almost always a mix of compensatory and additive, and it's probably shifting over the season. So like if you shoot a bird in early season, the likelihood they were going to survive to the next breeding season is pretty low. But if you shoot a bird in mid-February, like you shoot a chucker in mid-February, the likelihood it was going to survive and start its next breeding cycle is pretty high. And so that's where, that's where the probability of additivity starts to increase is, as the season goes on. So it's this, it's this real complex shifting uh, to thing. And it's, it's, it's something we, we actually need to understand better uh, than we do right now. Um, but uh, we've been trying to do that with, with forest grouse. Uh, but uh, so we've been putting bands on birds in our studies and uh, we put what 130 dusky grouse bands over two, two years in Logan Canyon area, and we got three band returns total uh, of all 130 birds. And one of those was from a hiker in the spring that just saw a leg on a rock and the band. So we only had two that were actually harvested. So it, it, it's there's give you some confidence that the rate is pretty low overall of the population. If you're only getting two band returns out of 130 bands out there, but um, it, it didn't allow us to actually look at harvest rate and, and try to estimate it. So maybe over time, as, as we uh, continue to study them, we can, we can build up a data set that we can do that. But really interesting questions. Um, yeah. Yeah. One thing just to compare that to, like with wild waterfowl species, you might have like 15 or 20 percent band returns from all the individuals you'll you'll put bands on. So you compare that to upland species and you can see that like hunting just really isn't as big of a form of mortality for upland species, which is why we have really long seasons and larger bag limits for them, just because if you, you can either shoot them or they'll die a dozen other ways before the next hunting season. So we try to take advantage of harvest as much as we can with upland species. Thanks, Blair. Uh, Brett, anything on that spatial thing I mentioned? Well, I mean, I'm not really a, a biologist, but I, I like to read your studies and I like to try to think I understand them. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, for me, when I'm hunting duskies, if I'm not finding birds, I just keep covering ground. Um, th that's, I think that's one place that you know, people overlook the advantages of, of having a dog that can really get out and cover some ground. Um, 
I can't cover very much ground, but boy, these dogs, they can really get out and, and scoot. And, and if they're honest and, and, you know, but, but that, so I would just add that I, I, for me, it's just about covering ground. If you're not finding birds, cover more ground. Um, if you don't find birds today, go to a new spot and cover a bunch of ground. I mean, it, it, even if you're, even if you're dumb like me, if you cover enough ground, eventually you're going to run into something. <clears throat> the blind squirrel adage is that what you're touting that's that's what i'm good <laughs> <laughs> blind squirrel with a big running dog um, yeah I, I agree with the big running dog on on duskies and some of the more open country with rough grouse i want my dogs a little tighter but um but they normally you know they can adjust to that thicker cover okay alexander i've been ignoring you for far too long what's you had your hand raised a little bit ago. Yeah, no, thank you guys very much. Uh, I appreciate everything that you're doing here. Um, you know, I'm, I'm new to upland hunting here in Utah, and I have my first uh, bird dog that, you know, been doing a lot of work with, having a great time. He's a, he's a GSP. And I am Congrats. Right, you you know, got the right you. breed. I appreciate yeah, that. Great, yeah. great dog so far. <laughs> um, and I guess my question is more so around ethics as I kind of come into this new uh, – into this, you know, new, new hunt. Um, I'm a big game hunter, uh, mostly archery. And where I find myself running into a lot of duskies is where I go archery hunting. And, you know, I guess my, my direct question, if this is the appropriate form for it is, you know, given that the two seasons kind of collide, you know, should I kind of stay out of those heavier elk trafficked areas, especially in kind of those archery season um or is it okay to kind of go up there midday and start busting off some some duskies where i've been you know kind of marking them so your your worry is about other hunters and disturbing animals for other hunters is that do i yeah. understand that right <laughs> yeah exactly so i'm based here in salt lake um and you know just hunting up north from here and just like you said i don't I don't want to go out there and necessarily disturb other hunters, ruin other hunts. Um, and I'm not sure if that's, if that's realistically that big of a thing, you know, um, cause I've, I've never experienced it once in my elk hunt, but again, I don't want to be, be the, the guy kind of, uh, putting out a bad name for upland hunters. <laughs> Can I take this one? Um, yep. so yeah, I, I'm not a big game hunter at all. I'd like to say that. First of all, um, earlier in the thing where you guys were talking about, are you ever big game hunting and wish you weren't? No, I'm always hunting birds. Um, but I think this we're, the issue we're getting to is land use conflicts, right? And those are growing as more people are getting into our public lands. We're having land use conflicts with mountain bikers and hikers. And I mean, I, I, some of the grouse covers that I used to hunt, um, uh, you know, are up hiking trails that I just don't go to anymore because quite frankly, I and mean, some of the people that were on the hike controls were offended that I was walking up there with a shotgun. So um, those land use conflicts, they happen. My advice, I, I try to, when I go in the forest, I try just not to be a jerk. I mean, I, I try to stay away from where other people might be using it. And, and that's not always possible, but I mean, if, you, if someone's parked close by, I mean, go someplace else, just, just try, to, try to avoid it. Um, I personally have never knowingly screwed up somebody's hunt um I, i've sure been on a lot of trail cams but um <laughs> my dog's probably still. in fact somebody got me face planted in the mud just a couple weeks ago on a trail <laughs> cam i'd like to prove that it is <laughs> but anyway was that um, a voluntary action on your part oh it was horrible man I, mm -hmm. I tripped on a stick it was perfectly flat ground there was nothing around and i just hey man it was a step 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 face plant right and anyway but um so if you've got that footage please send it to me i'd like to i'd like to see how, what my form was like um <clears throat> anyway but that that's what i have to say about that about land use conflicts i i appreciate the insight i think it's i think it's a great great point and definitely helps out so thank you very much brett so my i i follow what brett does i if I, if I'm there and people are in there and I know it, I'm, I won't go disturb their hunt. Right. I, in fact, um, I, I passed up, I passed up probably four or five spots this year, forest cross hunting because the bow hunt was on and I saw the trucks and the ATVs and I just, and some of them are my favorite spots. So I like, I want to go there real bad. 
but as soon as they're out of there, I'll, I'll go back in there um, and, and hunt as long as I'm not directly disturbing them like that. That's been, that's how I've handled that. Does anybody else like to make a comment or? You know, I, I'd chime in just real quick. I'm not too far off from what you guys do. Um, I, but the bow season's so long. I, I won't abandon the woods during the bow season. It's just too long. Um, so there has to be some sharing uh, of the resources and stuff. Like I went to one of my favorite areas just a couple weeks ago. And um, there were some other trucks there, but I, I felt very comfortable of where those bow hunters were at. And I was going a different direction. And we actually ended up running into each other on the way back um, about where I thought they would be. And they were perfectly good with it. Um, but a caveat, like right now is about my least happy time in Utah because it's nothing but gun, but rifle hunting now. And I just won't put my dog up there. I, I just go to Idaho during this time of the year because with, with the rifle hunts, I just, even though I'll never hunt weekends, um, never hunt opening days. Um, when there's, you know, a bow hunting's opening up or muzzle loading's opening up or whatever, I'll never hunt those opening weekends and stuff. I try to hunt during the week when there aren't people up there, but, um, when, once the rifles crack open, I, I just leave. I, I don't, I don't stop hunting. I just go someplace where I know there aren't any rifle hunters. I, I just won't risk it. So Randy, I'm, I'm laughing because I, I was up hunting today and I, I, stopped in at a, a blue grouse ridge that i really like to hunt and there was a camp of muzzleload hunters I it opened today apparently and um i my dog started going towards their camp and i was trying to call her back and as i was trying to call her they started calling uh using different words trying to confuse her i, I don't think they're happy i was there um so i was trying to get out of there i didn't want to upset anybody but then my dog pointed a bird right above camp and uh i i shot at it i didn't hit it <laughs> but i shot at it and uh and then we got out of there but it, it was yeah it was just a little bit of an interesting moment for me with these issues yeah yeah i actually went out today and i wanted to go try a new area and then i thought like yeah it seems like something's opening up and so I just like, ah, oh, damn it. It's the muzzle loader. And so I ended up going someplace else and got into some huns and stuff today. But, um, but yeah, you just, you just have to play with that. I, it's for me, it's all about what type of hunt it is. Um, rifle hunt. I just completely avoid it. Um, the other stuff, I just try to be real conscious where those other hunters are. I mean, we have to share the resource. Thanks, Randy. Um, I noticed Blair put up some definitions of additive and compensatory uh, mortality. So us biologists are pretty insensitive to some of the terminology we use. So um, that might help you understand what uh, what those things are if you're not familiar with that. Um, I do I do have a bit of a soapbox I want to hit real quick with this. One thing that I see I see a lot of fraction inside the hunting community where there's bow hunters against, you know, rifle hunters or bird hunters against rifle hunters or, or whatever. And, and we create these conflicts and we're, we all need each other so much. <laughs> we, we need, we need the hunting community because uh, of what we face on a much bigger scale than what, you know, in society. Um, we are dwindling and what we rely on is that about 85 percent of americans are okay with hunting if we use the meat and if that percentage goes away or goes down we're in trouble and and that's that's the big fight i think and and if we fight amongst ourselves i i just i think we have to be very careful how we do that and i don't know if you've watched some of the news but there's there's uh was it California or one of the West coast States was having issues with hounds and uh, another frac uh, faction of hunters. Uh, and those hunters were complaining against the houndsmen and there was a bear with a bear hunting. And anyways, there was, there was something in the news recently where I was like, man, these, you, these two groups of people need each other more than they know, but that's my soapbox and I'm off of it now. 
<clears throat> hey, Dave, can I say something real quick? Absolutely. Hey, this, I just wanted to say that um, I used to worry a lot more about other hunters and hikers and things like that. And I've gotten in my older age and realizing that I've never really had that many bad experiences, very few, mostly really good experiences. And I don't worry about it near as much. I'd be respectful. But look, but I go and do enjoy my hunting and my dogs and I've made lots of friends. I've met lots of people and I'd say 99% of them are good contacts, especially with, even with hikers and stuff. A lot of them want to talk to me about my dogs or what we're doing up there, the birds. So I think uh, sometimes it gets blown out of proportion or we get worried about it because one, one bad experience. But if you look at it as a whole, a lot of us are up there doing good things. And actually, I think talking and having a conversation and, uh, and building relationships just helps all of it. So I don't, I think, yeah. And I don't even, and worrying about your dogs getting shot or hurt or someone getting mad. I don't know of anybody that's had that happen. That certainly hasn't happened to me. And I'm actually surprised I run into as few people as I do. So. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing Travis. I've never, I've never had somebody attempt to hurt a dog or um, I've never heard of anybody in that situation. I have been yelled at and, uh, cussed at, um, one, one time I was force cross hunting and I walked into a spring and I didn't know a bow hunter was sitting on it and he, he was rather upset. Um, but I, if I was the, I like to bow hunt too. So I'd be pretty upset if I took all that time and, and then somebody walked in on me, but that's, that's public lands and we have to accept that. Um, so Gavin, uh, this recording will be posted on, uh, my website. Uh, it's, uh, USU, uh, grouse range.com. Um, and so I'll have it there after this is over. Hey, hey Dave, can I chime in on one more thing? I forgot yep. to say it earlier. A um, couple questions early on were about just finding spots. Uh, the article, I think it was Chuck or maybe it's Chuck or, and you, I, I apologize if I got the author wrong, um, that you guys have posted on your uh, Utah State University website on grouse hunting is really, really good. And I think that would help people um, when they're doing their, their e-scouting or just the old fashioned going out in shoe leather. That's a really good article I think people would benefit from. Thanks, Randy, for pointing that out. I should have thought of that sooner. So true, Chuck. So we're co-authors on it. Um, and Chuck did some of the analysis. So we we basically looked at dusky grouse uh, locations in the fall from our GPS units and just looked at those locations and then looked at habitat types that they were using and then did it on a on a time, September, October, November, and uh, and and tried to show some of the things that the, the birds were telling us about where they wanted to be. Uh, in the fall. And that's on that same website in the uh, references uh, section. It's, it's towards the top there. The article is called, um, oh my gosh, top of my head, how to improve your forest cross hunting skills, I think. So I was oh, able to get my... you, have a, you have a hands up if you didn't notice. Uh, Matt, are you, you got your hand up again? Yeah, I think uh, I think for the first time. Uh, thanks. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thanks for all the information on forest grouse. Uh, I kind of consider myself primarily a grouse hunter, and I've learned a ton uh, specifically about duskies. So thanks to everyone. Um, I, if it's okay, I'd like to switch gears a little bit, and uh, I've got a question uh, about finding huns and chuckers. Um, specifically around chuckers, you know, I, I, I definitely, I chase chuckers in the northern part of the state, know some places uh, where I can find them, but I definitely have no sort of uh, understanding of what I'm looking for when I'm, when I'm trying to find new areas. You know, obviously western desert, because I'm out of Salt Lake, uh, rock bands, food, cover, but I definitely still don't know what I'm looking for or going after as I'm trying to survey things specifically on the ground uh, as I look for new spots. So again, without hotspotting, any, any insights anybody, Brett, uh, could provide uh, with some, some insights and, uh, and maybe where or what to look for. 
there's a plethora of uh, experienced people here, so I don't want to have to do all the talking. Yeah, um, I mean, I cover ground. <laughs> I don't know. Run, run, big running dogs. Um, really, I mean, there's there's a there's a, a way to look at a Chucker Mountain and go, yeah, they're right there. Uh, Chucker, I find to be most of the time a little bit more predictable than maybe dusky grouse or or some of the other other species. Um, and it depends on what time of year you're hunting and, and everything else. I mean, obviously they need a water source to get through the summer. Um, most of the time when I'm hunting in this winter time and, um, you know, as soon as the green up happens, you start to get some green up on, on south facing slopes, but even north facing slopes before the, before the snow falls. And I mean, most of the time when you cut a chucker's crop open, that's what he's eating. Uh, unfortunately, you know, you look at the mountain, there, there can be a lot of that. So, um, uh, I don't know. I, I think, I think I'll let, uh, you know, Travis or Alan or one of these guys jump in right here and, and maybe try to add to what they've got to say. No one wants to chime in. <laughs> I, I, I'd like to chime in. I just I'm, give another well, I'm waiting, chance. I'm waiting for Travis. He's better than I am. <laughs> Go, go, Dave. I'll just, so, so I'm an upland hunter and I'm also an upland game biologist, which is a interesting place to be. And one of my um, pet peeves about upland hunters, I'll just, I'll just say it like that. I'm, and I'm including myself. Okay. Is that we look at the habitat that we hunt in the fall and that's our only image of what we think is important to that species. And whether that's when I was in Kansas as the pheasant biologist, it drove me nuts when people wouldn't understand that you have to have spring habitat for nesting before you can ever have fall birds. <laughs> and and they, would, they would ignore that. And, and, the, and the, one of the common things is, is this idea of cattails, that cattails support pheasants. No, cattails are where pheasants go to hide in the winter when there's nothing else out there. Otherwise they're using all sorts of other stuff and they actually need row crops and all these other things. So that, that's a, berries is another one for forest grouse. That yeah, you find forest grouse with berries because they're eating them, but that's their ice cream shop. That's not what's getting them from the female stage to the egg stage to the chick survival. The chicks aren't surviving off of berries. They're surviving off of insects and and forbs and the berries only come on later um uh but when it comes to chucker this this is this is one of my things is you have to find brooding habitat for chucker then you find the ledges and the stuff associated with that brooding habitat that's why you find chucker for me anyways and then the best way to find chucker is wait for the snow and go to the burned areas that's what is my best tip what is brooding habitat for chucker um so brooding habitat for chucker are those long sagebrush valleys um in and amongst the the cliffy stuff so the chucker will come usually come off the slope to nest they'll still nest in rocks and craggy stuff but they're usually not up as high when they're nesting and then they brood in those valleys. They don't brood up on the slopes because they need insects. And those insects are in that, those big sagebrush valleys. So you, you, have to, you have to have that before you have the chucker that are up on the craggy stuff that kills us. Travis, I'll let you take it from there. I'm trying to think what I would add. Um, I would say probably, the the things be, that help me to find them the most I, I i think looking for poop you look so if you want to if you want to find chuckers and you go in habitat i they they like to roost in certain areas and so if you look in rock areas and you can do this so when i was exploring i had a goal to find 100 different chucker hunts um, within an hour of my house and it's amazing where chuckers are. I mean, so many people ask, you know, where I can't find chuckers. I'm like, well, it's really hard not to find chuckers if you 
um, if you get out there and this year's is going to be a tough year. So let me, <laughs> this year would be harder, but, uh, and the, but if you will go out and look under the rock bands and the rock cliffs and you look for droppings, a lot of times I learn a lot about where the chuckers are from the droppings and that's how I'd scout new areas. I'd go with my dogs and do a walk to a rock band in the, so like February through April, I'll go walk to rock bands. I'll look for sign. And based on that sign, I'll tell how many chuckers, you know, if I feel like there's chuckers there, then I'll drive to another canyon or another ridge and do the same type of thing. But um, that was probably more telling to me than anything. I like Dave's point about they have to have some brood rearing habitat. Um, and if it's missing that, um, that can be a, a, a key piece that's gone, but I'm, I'm amazed at where they live. It seems if, if, if the habitat, if something burns and becomes chucker habit, they seem to check her habitat. They seem to find their way there. And his point about when you're trying to find them and when you're hunting in the winter and you get the a good snow that covers the North slope. So it pushes them onto the South slopes that, that really, that eliminates a lot of the country for you. So then you can find them and gain some confidence and where they're at, you can see their tracks, you'll see their sign, they'll get crowded in there. And so you'll see a lot more scat and stuff too. And that helps you to, uh, to gain confidence that that mountain range has birds. Have you had, uh, is it McRaven? I'm not sure what your name is. It said, I think it says McRaven on there, but have you been able to find some chuckers on certain ranges as you've been out? Oh yeah, I've definitely found chuckers. And I, again, I, I have a general idea of what I'm looking for. Um, but again, for me, it's about following some of the practices we were talking about earlier in, in the grouse uh, discussion, which is not going the same place over and over and over again, where I know a couple of my buddies also hunt and just looking to, to expand that range and more opportunities. So, uh, you know, I, first and foremost, thanks, because all that was very helpful. And the second point is, yeah, I just need to spend less time behind the desk and more time uh, out looking around after the season's over and uh, and during that uh, brooding season. So thank you very much. Yeah, that's that's good advice for all of us. Um, I, I'll add too, during the brooding, like when they have chicks, that's when you'll hear them a lot. If you go out, yeah. if you go out early season brooding, that's when they'll chuck and kind of let you know that they're there. So that can um, that can help you gain confidence too. So the the research says that the most the most common the most frequent chucking or calls that they make is from March to uh, what is it May and it's 45 minutes before sunrise so that that 45 minutes leading up to sunrise is when they call the most often and that's how like in the Middle East that's how they do surveys for them is early morning uh, call surveys. Dave, can I say something? Of course. This is, uh, you know, to speak to M. Craven or McCraven, as well as anybody else listening um, that already maybe knows that there are chuckers on a particular mountain range, but are just having trouble maybe finding where those birds are during hunting season. Um, I always tell people to hunt a ridgeline. Um, often a good place to start is to hunt the lake line. So a lot of these mountain ranges have uh, what I call the lake line of, of uh, Lake Bonneville or things like that. Another really good place to find chuckers during the hunting season is on the upper two thirds or upper third of a large grassy basin. So if you have a mountain range that has sort of a big uh, basin, you know, go right to the center of that upper third. So anyway, I just wanted to, if there are people out there that know there are birds and want to get into chucker, but I just can't find them on the mountain, those are three spots that oftentimes hold chucker. I know that kind of goes against Dave's a little pet peeve there, but anyway. Thanks, Caleb. Hope, hope that helps. Can I, can I just share a little anecdote? When I first got into chucker hunting, I, I hadn't lived in Utah very long, and I'd grown up in North Dakota, so I grew up pheasant hunting and sharp tail and hunts but mostly pheasants that's that's what we did and and i had two little springers and just loved doing that and uh i i started reading about them and stuff and i found a place out in west desert and i went out there and i parked with my brother and we we walked about 200 yards up straight up this hill we were almost to that lake bench that kayla was talking about and we both looked at each other and said 
there's no self-respecting game bird that would live in this crap. They just, no way they would do it. Just because I, I, I came from peasants, right? And uh, about three years later, after I learned some stuff, I returned to that spot and I got into Covey right, right above where we stopped. Um, so it just, give yourself time uh, to, if, if you're new at it and, and it'll, it'll come time and, and, and boot leather. Um, I did want to, so I have the report from the Chucker uh, camera study, uh, stuff that they did this, this summer. Um, so they uh, put out, uh, let's see, 42 is what it looks like. 42 cameras um, total, no, 40 cameras total. Uh, five in the northern region, 20 in the central, uh, 10 in the southern region, and five in the southeastern region. Um, in, in 2020, uh, they had a few more hits uh, per camera than in 2021, as far as just uh, birds showing up. But as far as chicks uh, uh, per adult, uh, like for the northern region in 2019, there was 2.5 chicks per adult. In 2020, there's 1.3 chicks per adult. And in this year, there was 0.1 chicks per adult. So we went from 2.5 to 0.1. That's a very large percentage drop uh, in the northern region. In central, we went from 4.8 chicks in 2019 per adult to 1.0 in per adult in 2020 and down to 0.1 this year. And Southern and Southeastern went to zero. So they started at 1.9 and 3.0 in 2019 and they had zero chicks this year on cameras. So that that's probably the story for chuckers <laughs> in Utah this year. You, there's gonna be very few young birds uh, probably reduced populations because of that. And lots of adult birds that are there, they're going to be adults and they're going to be a little savvier. Um, that's probably what we're going to experience this year. Doesn't mean there's not birds out there to be found. Um, and certainly there's specific spots that production could have went pretty well. And I've heard reports from uh, areas that uh, like uh, up here in Northern Utah where um, in a lot of years, it's more snow limited areas, um, but those areas didn't get the snow and the truckers did okay there and this year. And so um, I, for me, that's where I'm gonna be looking is uh, in, in areas that I, I think you, in, in high snow years, the truckers are gonna suffer. That's, that's where I'm gonna be spending most of my time. Um, any, any comments about how the trucker population is doing besides tears and crying and stuff like that. Dave, one thing I learned from Travis was you got to go to the top of the hill. <laughs> if you're not making it to the top of the mountain, you're not, you're missing a bunch of birds. Agreed. Yep. What well, Caleb said, stay on that ridge and follow it that's uh get to the top good advice and having a dog that sweeps off of that ridge and yeah it's very good uh gavin asks what elevation is too high for chucker i'm trying to think of the highest i've seen them well i saw i saw a discovery show that had a species of chucker at fourteen thousand feet in the himalayas but around Utah, I would say what, 8,500, 9,000 feet, something that'd be like the highest. Um, you may, they may not even go that high. But. Anybody wanna have a better answer than that? You know, I just might say that, you know, the higher you get on Utah mountain ranges, the less that habitat becomes chucker habitat. Once you get above that, 8,500, 9,000, then you're in pine, you know, conifers yeah. and 
and not that you cannot find them there, but you know, and most of the mountain ranges in the western part of the state aren't much higher than 8,000 feet. So yeah. uh, that's not true exactly, but um, most so are. Yeah, most are. You know, as a basis. Yeah, once once you get too far out of that pinion juniper zone going up, I mean, you can find them above that, but not too far above that. So Paula asked, are the reduced numbers to drought only? Uh, what other factors come into play? Um, I would say reduced numbers are primarily due to drought because, but that's because chucker rely on reproduction. They have generally low survival. Um, everything loves to eat chucker, right? And um, just the adult survival on average is pretty low uh, for that species. And, and so they, they just rely on high reproductive output to grow populations um, maintain and grow. And when you have a drought like this, you just, we just don't get high reproductive output to either the nests don't survive because there's not enough cover, or it gets too hot or the chicks are maybe hatched, but then there's not enough insects or it's too hot. Um, so that's the, the pro I, I tell, this is the saying I have for my daughters when they ask about chuckers. Um, what is the old, the April showers bring May flowers and May flowers bring June bugs and June bugs bring September chuckers. And that's a pretty simple way uh, that I've had to look at it. Um, but yeah, certainly predation uh, can have a play. Um, sometimes, especially locally, you might have some things, but across the board, production, production, production is the key. Um, for chuckers and yes it's a it's a normal boom and bust this we're just in the bust right now um chuckers have always boomed and bust they're they're a lot like quail like that quail you, you're never going to have a steady <laughs> we've, we've never seen a steady uh population of chuckers you've never seen a steady population of quail it just doesn't happen Any other comments about that? There's a few on the thing about elevation. But that, that kind of helps us with the forecast of Chucker. Um, there were some questions earlier about ptarmigan. Um, so I'm gonna let, I know Brett's chased them. I know Caleb's chased them. Um, there's probably many others. Um, I've chased them a couple times without success. Uh, so I can tell you what not to do, but... Uh, I'll let other people chime in, if you would, please. I'll go first. Okay. Um, to be fair, I don't know that much about ptarmigan. I know less about ptarmigan than any other bird that I hunt. Um, I can tell you what was in their crop. They had little green shoots in them. Um, it, it was all over the, the mountain. They were, in, they were kind of on benches covered in rocks. And um, this is, I get asked more about ptarmigan than any other species of bird, and I know you very little about them. Um, we had success due to some friends that that did the research and 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 took us in. So um, I know that Caleb knows quite a bit. So Caleb, you want to talk about it? All right, that's awful for you guys. I don't think you, I know as much as you might think I do. But you know, ptarmigan are one of those really difficult birds to pursue just because of where they are, and there is a, a very large. Uh, area of you know possible habitat but within that huge area of possible habitat there really are just very small pockets of of really good habitat and it's it's hard to kind of determine it just all looks like rocks really and it, it really isn't there's a lot more to that habitat up there than just just rocks and tundra uh, you know to the listeners that are wanting to pursue ptarmigan this year or in any other year uh, I would suggest you know, getting up as long as you are above 11,000 feet, maybe 11.5 even, um, and then anywhere up to about, you know, 12,500 or so seems to be where that preferred habitat is, where you're, um, they can you also- say, Can you say above tree line? 
basically. Above tree line, I guess. Yeah, I should have made that clear. Um, there have been reports of people seeing them below tree line, but generally during the hunting season, that's where they are above tree line. I've tend, I've found them most frequently uh, up against hillsides. I think there's several reasons for that. Where those hillsides are with larger rocks, uh, the water tends to, uh, or rather I should say the snow tends to stay longer and that produces more forbs and insects. And, and those forbs and insects are, I think, what uh, creates that better ptarmigan habitat. Um, although I will say they are, like Dave will, mention, I mean, they are a, a prairie grouse in some ways, um, and they really do move like a prairie grouse, even as much as a sage grouse, some might say even more than a sage grouse uh, during the entirety of the year. And so just because they're somewhere in September, they could be five or six miles from that location in December. So yeah, Tom Regan really interesting in Utah because they um, we just have such limited habitat pockets of these big basins and above tree line. So they do move between seasonally, they can move big. Most of that research is out of Colorado that shows that. But within season, they have really it's really tight um, when they're in nesting or brooding versus going to winter. That's the big. That's the big switch is summer, fall, early fall to winter is when they usually do the big movements. Um, yeah. But yeah, the, the um, I think it's, it's getting more and more popular. Uh, people are going in. Um, I've, I've always, I've done it while I've been doing other stuff and I've tried to access it from the tundra from a road, which if, if you know the UN is at all, there's like one place that can do that, two, maybe two um with little success so i would say um go in like others have done where you you go go high and backpack in you know you're gonna you're gonna spend a day or more just getting there so dave makes some oh i'm sorry dave no go ahead he makes some really good points that that core habitat most of it is a substantial distance from any road there is that that uh you know, spotty habitat that may be near a, a, a highway or road, but most of that core habitat that isn't fragmented um, substantially is near uh, or, or is very far away from roads. Uh, I will also, you know, Dave makes a very good point that that summer range is very limited to the point that I have found ptarmigan, if you find them in this one area uh, in years to come, they will literally be within a hundred feet of that area um, every single year. And not to suggest that you should go back to that area and shoot it necessarily every single year, but, but literally I have found them within feet of where that covey was even three years ago, we would go back and it's not the same birds, it's not the same covey, uh, but whatever it is about that particular niche habitat that they're using on that hillside, um, I mean, it really attracts those ptarmigan, and, and that's a good place to look if you found that. Thanks for your input, Kate. Appreciate it. I only have one more thing to add. I took a dog in with me on that hunt that runs about 150 yards out on a good day, and I sure wished I'd have taken my big running dog because there was a lot of country to cover up there. So I just, you know, big running dogs help. Or even bring two dogs, and if you do, go a substantial distance to the, before you get to the habitat, collar that dog the entire way in, uh, or else you'll have that big running dog not be worth a darn after 15 miles that you did and 30 miles that he did before you even get to ptarmigan country. Good call. Yeah, we have, actually have one of our biologists on the call and the Jason Robinson, if you want to chime in at all, he's he's actually in the process. Oh, of I didn't know Jason him. was here. Yeah, he probably knows more about him than anybody else in the state. So, yeah. <laughs> you guys hear me? Oh, you're hiding behind your name. <laughs> My name not showing up. Yeah, your your name is home. Oh, well, I'm home, so that counts. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I don't know how long you want to spend on ptarmigan, but I can maybe add a little bit. 
Just a little bit, yeah. Oh, uh, so um, I've hunted every upland game bird in North America, I think now, and white-tailed ptarmigan, I think, are my very favorite. They're amazing, fascinating birds. Hunting them in the UN is, is unlike any other hunt you'll go on. It's amazing. Um, so, you know, start real basic. The Uinta Mountains are the only place here in Utah that we have ptarmigan. You can hunt them in Colorado, Alaska, and California as well. Um, so they occur basically from Mirror Lake Highway all the way over to Lighty Peak um, and everything in between. Um, they're an introduced bird. They were introduced in 1976 here in the state. Um, and they've done very well in the Uintas where they have good habitat. I think all the stuff that folks have mentioned um, is, is spot on. I think I've hunted them every year for the last 10 or 12 years. Um, my, my advice is be in shape and make sure your dogs are in shape. Um, I generally run a minimum of two dogs, but up to four dogs when I'm in ptarmigan habitat. Um, my long-term average is about 24 dog miles per covey. Uh, so we're running, basically, a, the dogs are running a marathon between each covey of, of ptarmigan. Uh, finding them uh, is the hard part. Getting there is the hard part. Not necessarily that difficult to, to shoot once you've found them. Um, and, you know, shooting out a brood is always a concern. So, you know, to get into a, a group of birds, you know, take two, you know, out of that brood, depending on how big it is. Uh, try and leave the, the mom, you know. Uh, ptarmigan are one of the longest lived game birds in in the world really and so they have very low output and you know high survival but elevation is probably the biggest thing getting ptarmigan habitat um, I, I generally find them between 11,300 and about 12.5 uh, you usually find the, the the males and the broodless hens up to that 12,000 feet during the hunting season um, the broods are usually right around that that 11,500. Uh, willow is key. You know, Dave touched on that um, broodering habitat for other species. You know, we focus in on the fall, but with ptarmigan, willow is very important. I've I've only seen them a handful of times during the hunting season in willow, but there's always willow within eyesight, um, usually down below you, and so that's really a key key component. Um, is having that willow, but often they're up on those big bare ridges uh, and, you know, 12,000 feet, uh, see them a lot of that elevation. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of little caveats to it, but the biggest thing is um, get a good map, take a lot of time studying your route in, save your dog on the way in, um, and then, you know, just plan on doing a lot of miles with a big running dog. I think that's it. Thanks, Jason. Appreciate it. Yeah. If I knew you were here, I'd be tapping you more. <laughs> that's why. I, <laughs> that's why you're hiding yourself. That's why I was being quiet. There you go. <laughs> All right. Well, we've covered most of the birds in in Utah. That um, I know pheasants are what they are. <laughs> if you're if you have access to wild pheasants, lucky you. Enjoy it. Um, I do think we've, I think from some things I've seen where there's some wild birds, the hatch looks decent, um, at least northern Utah up here. But um, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I grew up in North Dakota. I have a hard time hunting pheasants in Utah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's just a little different. I have seen some pretty decent pheasant broods, um, even on some of the WMAs. Um, cool. So, I mean, I wouldn't say it's it's banner year for pheasants by any stretch, but there are some, which is more than I can say for you know <laughs> some of the some of the places we haven't had much of a hatch on other birds, but we have had a little bit of a pheasant hatch, and we've had some quail uh, some quail hatch. I've seen some quail broods that were pretty good size. Good. One thing um, that may be worth noting, many of you are probably familiar with this, but we started releasing birds a few years ago on our our waterfowl or our wildlife management areas, as well as the waterfowl areas and some of our walk and access properties. Um, we put out thousands and thousands of pheasants in the state now, 
And so all that information can be found on our webpage. We have our release areas that are marked there. Um, we start doing it the first week of the hunt and do it every week throughout the hunt. So if you're into pheasant hunting, you don't have any private property to hunt, that is an option for you where there are lots of birds and you can find them on just about all those properties throughout the week. Uh, Paula, you have a question? Yeah, I do. Just a quick one. Wondered about, um, so the pheasants that you guys put out, how many of those are surviving to the next year or did most of those get harvested or killed by predation? So a lot of those birds um, are typically gone by I don't know, a couple of days after we put them out. Um, people have keyed in on those, those areas where we release birds. So you do want to get there and try to hunt it fairly regularly throughout the week if you want to get on birds because they do go down. The number of birds go down pretty quick after we release them. Um, there are some that are taken through predation, but what we found is that most people are hunting those areas frequently enough that most of them are getting harvested, which is good. Um, there have been a lot of studies though that have shown that releasing birds they generally don't have a high survival over a long period of time. And so the whole point of us putting them out is that we want people to go out there and harvest them before they die of something else. So um, get out there, hit it hard and often, and you'll definitely get in the birds at some point. Awesome. I'm in full support of that. Yeah, Paula, sometimes if you get out there and, there's no, and you're not finding any pen raised birds, hunt past it a lot of these places do hold wild populations of pheasants and I think they get overlooked and people just start hunting the, the pen raised birds. Um, I've killed wild birds on just about every WMA along the Wasatch Front um, in the last few years. So there are some around that are wild also. Thank you. Uh, another thought I had on that. So even with those pen raised, um, is it, you still can't shoot hens, is that correct? Yep, that's correct. It's only only roosters. My my understanding, and correct me, Blair, but they it's primarily roosters that they're releasing. They're not releasing hens. Yep. Yeah, at least during the hunt. Um, we have had SFW donating a whole bunch of hen pheasants. Um, they've been getting them just for super cheap. And so we've been putting them out just in hopes that some of them will survive. And they do. I mean, it's probably, I don't know, a couple of percentage, less than 5% of them are probably surviving through the year. But we have seen birds with bands on them with broods on our WMAs. And so there are some being carried over that are producing young out there. So it is helping. Um, but, but yeah, during the pheasant hunt, all we're putting out are roosters. So you probably won't see many hens out there other than those rooster birds. So the, the studies out there on release birds are, are interesting. and and. Blair kind of mentioned this, but most of the studies show about 95% mortality in the first two to three weeks of release on, on parent birds in the fall. And so it, it can definitely increase hunting opportunity, but as far as a population booster, uh, releasing pen reared birds just is, has never proven to work and, and that's true for pheasants, that's true for bobwhite quail, what's well, true for a lot of different quail um, and that kind of thing. And so it's, it's just important to know that release programs are, they're all about hunting opportunity and, and very little to do with populations. Populations have to do with habitat and, uh, and the climate and those two things combined. And it's, it's one of the reasons like Pheasants Forever has really taken a stand on that and said, we're not gonna do release programs, we're gonna do habitat work. And, and that's really following the, the science out there, so. And we've tried to take that approach on some of our waterfowl management areas. Um, we've tried to manage for pheasants, but I mean, the, the challenge we have here in Utah is we're not a Midwestern state. I mean, we're Utah. We have fairly limited habitat to begin with. And that's really just gone downhill since the 50s or 60s when a lot of that was ag land and it's as it slowly gets developed we lose more and more productive pheasant habitat so I mean, really keen in our WMAs like Brett mentioned you will find wild birds there and now we're dumping a lot of penured birds there so if you like pheasant hunting, I mean really that's probably one of your best options in the state unless you have access to some really good private property. 
So who wants to take a stab at Huns? I'll try a little bit. Um, you know, Brett said he, he mentioned that he's seen a few, but they've been a little bit smaller cubbies. Um, the few I've seen, I would say the same thing. Um, I, I think um, there's, there's, certain, there's very specific areas in Utah that you could hit for public um, to, to get into huns, but I would say the vast majority of Utah huns are on private land uh, in, in Northern Utah. And so trying to find access and, and permission uh, is, is one of the biggest things when it comes to huns. Anybody else wanna chime in on that? I've seen a couple of them in the, in the middle of the summer that, that acted like they had broods. Um, I didn't see the actual broods themselves. And I did see a tailgate picture this last weekend um, of somebody that was sage grouse hunting that had huns also. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I don't know the, what the population is going to be like, but they are seeing them. I know that extreme northwestern Utah has has some huns on on public uh, land out there. I, I it's been very sporadic experiences for me um, when I do get into them, but. They do have them out there. I'd agree. It's difficult to, to target them in those types of places. I'm hunting them mostly on private lands. Um, and, and oftentimes I'm not hunting them. I'm running dogs on them and watching them fly away. But um, sometimes I, you know, I take a couple. Um, but we're, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're at the southernmost part of the Hungarian partridges range. And so our populations are, are really sporadic. And I haven't seen fantastic hunger and partridge uh, um, numbers since like the 90s. In the 90s, boy, we had some birds. Um, and, and I had a great time in the 90s. Um, but since then, I just haven't seen that many birds. And if, I, if my memory serves correctly, those populations were um, following some pretty severe winters, um, several in a row. Um, it, I might be mistaken. I mean, that's going off, you know, a memory that's really old. But mm -hmm. anyway, that, that's that's about all I have to add. I, I'll add something else. If you want to hunt huns, um, they're usually not in thick cover like pheasants live in. Right. They're usually not up on the up on the steep slopes like like chuckers live in. Um, they're down lower. Um, I like to hunt slivers that are in between. Um, like uh, stubble fields are great slivers of sagebrush or grass that's between stubble fields are leading down from from a, a, a foothill down to some some uh, some stubble or something and that, that's where I find them in Utah um, if anyone would like to add to that I find most of the huns that I run across are always up where the sage grouse are they're always higher than the you know the cultivated fields um, I like to call them mountain huns uh, because they aren't where I expect to find them. I find them a lot of times when I'm hunting chuckers and I have huns jump up. So it's really, it's really kind of weird. Huns are weird. We can just say that they're, they're very, it's hard to predict huns. It's hard to predict, uh, climate, how it affects them. It's hard to predict, uh, yeah, habitat type that they're going to like usually be in. That kind of thing. They're just they're they're very cool. They they're probably my favorite tasting game bird, but they're uh, um, yeah they're they're just a little more challenging, especially here. Yep. I do most of my hunt hunting north of here. <laughs> well, we're kind of we're kind of winding down on time. Um, any burning burning desire questions? Anything? Should we have a stump the biologist moment for all of us biologists here? <laughs> all right, then. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, close this up. Uh, the recording again will be on that uh, web page if you want to uh, share that or, or listen again if you want to uh, try to pick up those tips a little bit better. Uh, and look forward to an announcement uh, next next uh, 
end of the summer. We'll try to do something based on that poll. We'll try to do something in, in probably late August. And uh, we'll have a little more prep time and, and, and we can share this a little bit farther and wider. But I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I, I certainly did. And I learned some stuff too. So that's, uh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, right. It's pint night. So where's my, there it is. Okay, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. We'll uh, have a great season and take care of your dogs. Thanks, guys. Thanks, you guys. That was awesome. Thanks, Dave. Yeah. Appreciate you putting it together, man. Yeah. Hopefully, did, did it feel like it went too long? I mean, we're like we're an hour and thirty, hour and forty minutes. People are still people are still engaged. I don't think it's going too long. Okay. So it seemed, seemed like everyone was engaged to me. Yeah. What do you think? Good, I think it's a good format. I mean, it's it's hard to kind of keep it organized, but I think it was probably best as it. I couldn't expect it to go any better. And I think that's kind of what, what people need is just to be able to ask questions to people that know what they're doing. And it's a good way to learn. Yeah. I, I think, I think we really do have a, a, a growing cohort of these adult onset upland hunters who I, I'm just, I, I don't know. I'm running into them in different places in my life, whether they're students here, whether I'm, I mean, I was at Lowe's the other day and I, pulled my pickup to load something and a guy saw my sticker and came over like hey I just got a bird dog and I'm like are you into it and I'm like dude you don't have the time to listen to what I'm into but um <laughs> you know just uh I was getting a hamburger in Garden City the other day after a sage grouse hunt and the guy saw my orange on and he was like oh I've always wanted to do that my dad he hunted but he never took me and like I want to get into it and I really you know I love dogs and I don't know. I'm just, I'm, and maybe it's just my perception of things and my, you know, my little world I live in, but I just, I'm seeing more and more opportunity to help folks who are, you know, who are in this like new stage. And I, I do think there's a lot of people who, I mean, if they could big game hunt, they would, but the opportunity in Utah is just not like regular enough to get them hooked on hunting and, and I, I, I just think Upland offers so much that way. And, and so does Waterfall. I, those two things are, are where our opportunity is for new hunters in the state. Agreed. I mean, I, on, I think the adult onset hunters everywhere. I mean, my phone blows up constantly from, um, and I'm always glad to ask questions, but there's only so much I can do. So format right. like this is good. One thing we forgot to mention was that we all the chuckers were released prior to the. Oh, youth we hunt. didn't, did we? <laughs> yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> no, we didn't talk about youth hunts either. We should have done that. Well, we'll yeah. be more organized next year, <laughs> right? <laughs> we might Fair have someone enough. from the Upland Game Program here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't have to just wing it. <laughs> no, I did not, nothing against Heather or Avery. We yeah. we threw this together within what. Yeah within two weeks so yeah. and i scheduled it i just finally made a decision so we're just doing it this night and of course avery's on a muzzler hunt because he drew a tag which i don't blame him if i drew a tag i'd be there too so i think i counted about 60 at one time yeah we got up to we got close anyways my i know my zoom 55 or 60 that. yeah which is great i I, I honestly was like, man, are we going to get 10 or 15 people, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. so Jason and I went around the state doing these for a couple of years and we'd have turnouts. I mean, Utah County was our best where we'd get like maybe 40 people. Mm -hmm. But I've done quite a few waterfowl events like this where you had like five people in the room. So yeah, I think this really allows you to at least speak to people and it's a lot less than traveling around the state and things like that. So I think it works well. I also think based on the questions we got and and what some of the need is out there i think we can prepare for next time in the sense of okay you know i'm gonna have brett cover you know how do you hunt for chucker i'm gonna have you know somebody else cover you know forest grouse or 
hunt, you know, just, just so that it's, we're almost, we're anticipating those kinds of questions coming in that I just wasn't sure what the mix of more novice and more uh, experienced people would be. And maybe just the more novice people were more active in asking questions. I don't know, but um, there's a need out there, obviously, based on the questions we got. Yeah, I, I think visuals would be really helpful. I mean, talking about like the forest grass, canopy cover, stuff like that. Like, I mean, that makes sense to us because we know exactly what you're talking about. But I mean, yeah, I don't even know if people mid -story know what canopy cover is. <laughs> stem density and mid story, that doesn't just like pop in your head. Of course it pops yeah, in your head. I know. I mean, you throw up a picture up there of yeah. like typical, you know, broodering habitat for rough grouse or yeah. like the bench you're talking about with chuckers. And I mean, just point that out. I think people would also get a search image of. That's what a great have. idea, Blair. Just just being a little more, a little more hyper prepared and like, okay, we yeah. know that this is we're gonna need this and we're gonna need that. I think that's great. Yeah, I almost um, pointed out, and I thought Brett might kill me. I was gonna say, just look at all Brett's Facebook posts and <laughs> see where he's shooting birds when his dogs bring them back. That's exact. Just look for that. I've already tried. He takes locations <laughs> off of his pictures, and I can't get them. I've tried. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, you know where it's at anyway. You're already hunting the same place. <laughs> <laughs> Except for the private. I don't hunt a lot of private hunts. I'm, uh, jealous. I'm jealous of that. Well, I don't have access to as much private land as you might think. It's just really good private land. Yeah. So it's interesting, you know, you said the 90s. Um, so when we go back and look at hunt harvest across the states, yeah. mm -hmm. basically 98, 99 was like peak. Yeah. Yeah. And my experience then i was i was an undergrad here at usu and i could go out to east box mm -hmm. and and just drive roads and i mean i get my five in an hour easy um yeah and it was interesting because i thought that was pretty utah pacific specific or like southern idaho utah but yeah. i was talking to a biologist in wyoming um he's he's way up in the agency and we were talking about this this huge bump in hunts and i was like you saw it too and he said, this is what he told me. I, I'm still like reeling at this in my head. But he said, we hunted in 98, 99, <clears throat> we hunted south of Rollins, Wyoming, between the interstate and the Colorado line. And they were averaging 10 to 15 cubbies a day, uh, like four to six hours of hunting from Rollins to Colorado. Uh, that's unheard. Like, yeah, there's tons yeah. there, but it's like you see one here and one there. I was talking to Rick Danver on DLL because uh, I was up there doing some sage grouse research and I flushed a covey of huns up on one of their treatments. And I was like, what the hell are they doing here? So I, I went into Rick and I said, what's up, dude? Like, I just saw a covey of huns. He's like, oh, we always have one, two, three cubbies around, oh. always. And I was like, really? But he said in 98 and 99, he, he monitored... 52 and 62 cubbies wow. on DLL those years. That's unbelievable. But, but I would say it was like that here too. And I think the actual peak was probably earlier than that. I think, I think hunters caught on and that's why we harvested more in 98. Sure. I think the actual peak may have been a year or two earlier than that because Which, there were more hunts than you could shake a stick at. And you'd kill a limited chuckers hunting and just hunting hunts. Yeah. Because the chuckers were booming too. Yeah, the chuckers boomed at the same time. I mean, yeah. I was lucky. That's when I started chucker hunting. And I I feel bad for people trying to start right now. <laughs> like, oh, I know. It's, it's tough. It's, it's rough. Last few, yeah. I almost yeah. said that like you guys put out a ton of good information about finding coveys and it's like well you might be and right where you need to be but this year there's just not any they're not going to be there be yeah. Yeah. Maybe try yeah. your, a couple of years we should have said that more explicitly because you're right like you could follow this advice and still go bust and yeah. so are we we're going to go bust because we're going to be doing the same thing yeah right uh, no that's a good point too yeah. Yeah, it is. And I think a lot of people think that just because they're in good, it, just say grouse habitat, there's going to be, they're going to be covered up in birds. And that's, that's not even always the case. Even rough grouse habitat, you could yeah. be in like ideal rough grouse habitat. In certain years. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's, certain it's years. just not there. I would yeah, say this year, areas. at least nor, Northern Utah this year, I've, yeah. I'm almost like always when I'm in that kind of stuff, I'm like, yeah. bam, I'm in the birds. And in your world where I, where I think you're at. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah further south 
Not yeah, so I'm much. sure. I'm sure it goes away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So but much. if you look at the drought severity index, northern Utah didn't hit like extreme drought until late June, early July, and then spring or then summer rain started like mid late July. So there's only like two weeks of really severe drought, and southern Idaho was just like. And then, you know, it took them another week to hit severe drought. And so compared to freaking Southern Park, the Parker Mountain didn't get measurable rain or measurable precip for 16 months. No measurable precip for 16 months. I mean, you can't, you can't live. <laughs> you can't, yeah. It's hard it shows, to survive that. Yeah, sage grouse and pronghorn numbers are <laughs> almost non-existent on there. Yeah, and I would, I mean, I was going to mention this, it just, it just never quite got to this in the conversation, but, you know, when, when we did our brood surveys in the summer of 2020, we, we flushed three and a half times as many broods and birds as we did the year before in 19. So we like over tripled our counts in the summer, which when I look at the data over all the years we've been doing those counts, that almost always there was only two years it didn't lead to higher let counts the next spring right so that almost always you're going to get higher let counts but then we dropped a little not a whole lot but we dropped a little bit uh, in 2021 let counts so those birds did not get recruited into the population well at the same time we had dusky grouse over by ely nevada so same latitude right same weather precip same dryness we had 20, I think it was 24 radio marked female duskies by the end of the summer. All of them, almost all of them had chicks with them. They were all like high reproduction, just like Parker. Of those 24 by November, so between the end of August and November, we had seven alive. Really? Oh, wow. Between November and March, the beginning of the breeding season, three made it. Hmm. That's over 85% mortality. It's crazy. When you don't have, when, when you don't have vegetation that has anything in it <laughs> to eat, you can't, how, you know, let's go fast for a month and then try to outrun a lion. But it just ain't going to work. Yeah. I think that happened in chuckers too. I saw way more chuckers early on and they seemed to just be dying off and just, you know, even November and December when they'd normally have some green up coming up. I think yep. we lost a lot of birds. We had no soil moisture last winter. Yeah. We had no yeah. green cheatgrass, no green cheatgrass, except for a few spots that I found. And there were birds there. Yeah. And that's where the birds were. That's Absolutely. Me. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. That's exactly where the birds are going to be. Anywhere you can yeah. find where the cheatgrass was green this summer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, ha I had to hunt new areas. I had to, I ended up hunting places I'd never hunted before, before I found birds. So, which was it was great. But yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what you do. You move around till you find them. Yeah. yeah. All righty. Well, thanks everybody. Thanks for your support, and we'll. Uh, We'll look forward to next year. And I, if I don't talk to you sooner, I hope you all have a great season. Yeah. Yes, David. It's good to see you guys. <coughs> Take care. See you.